Welcome to this presentation to meet the experts titled, What is a Medical Speech Language Pathologist? with our expert Robin Neary, speech pathologist at Moffitt. Meet the Experts is brought to you by Moffitt Cancer Center's Patient Library and Welcome Center. Please visit moffitt.org slash meet the experts to see our upcoming sessions. The content in this presentation is not intended to be medical advice and the viewer should consult their physician should they have any medical questions. Viewers should not rely on information contained in this presentation for immediate or urgent medical needs. If you think you might be having a medical emergency, call your physician, go to the nearest emergency department, or call 911 immediately. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay seeking care because you watch this presentation. And now please welcome our expert, Robin Neary. Hi, thank you so much for having me here today. Um, so my presentation today is going to be discussing what is a, med a medical speech language pathologist. So again, my name is Robin Neary and I am a speech pathologist here at Moffitt Cancer Center. Um, there are three of us here that are full-time that work with our patients at Moffitt Cancer Center, both inpatient and outpatient. Um, and throughout this presentation, I'll be able to talk with you a bit about what our day looks like, um, the different services that we provide and what we can offer to our patients. So a little bit about me, I graduated from the University of Florida um, with a bachelor's degree in public relations, actually completely different from what I'm doing now. Um, so I worked in sales for a couple of years selling makeup, um, which was really fun. It was great. Um, but at some point I decided I wanted something um, a little bit different and, um, you know, something that could be a bit more helpful perhaps to people um, working in the medical um, field and just seeing what, what is out there. So I decided to go back to school to get my master's degree um, at the University of South Florida. So that was a two-year post-baccalaureate um, coursework that I needed to do in order to get ready for the master's program. Um, so then I received my master's degree in speech language pathology. Um, after you get your master's degree, every speech pathologist needs to have about a nine month to 12 month clinical fellowship year, um, sort of where you really um, just develop your skills a little bit more before you're kind of sent on your own to see patients. Um, you still have a supervisor that helps guide you through all of that. So I got my clinical fellowship at a local skilled nursing facility. Um, and then once I was, um, it's, it's called getting your C's, so uh, deemed to be competent basically in the field of speech pathology. Um, then I started working at local hospitals. I knew I really wanted to work in a hospital and ultimately um, that brought me to Moffitt Cancer Center. Um, so I started with Moffitt uh, full-time in 2017 and I've enjoyed it very much since that time. So let's talk a little bit about what does a speech language pathologist do? So a speech language pathologist is trained to identify, assess, and treat speech, language, and swallowing disorders. And that is defined by ASHA, which is our governing body, our national governing body. Um, so that's, that's what our scope of practice is. And a medical speech pathologist will work in a variety of different settings. So one of those settings could be a skilled nursing facility, like I mentioned, that's where I worked for a period of time um, while I got my C's. Um, so you'll be working with um, a, a variety of patients there too. Maybe they've had a stroke and they've um, been able to be discharged and go into this skilled nursing facility for ongoing care. They need some more rehabilitation um, or perhaps they've, um, you know, just have such severe, impairments that they're unable to go home and, and they're going to be in the skilled nursing facility long term so we can help patients um, in that regard as well. There's also home health speech pathologists who um, will work with the patient in their home so they've been discharged maybe from the hospital after um, a prolonged hospitalization they uh, maybe have some swallowing issues or some speech deficits they're safe to go home but they still need some additional therapy and perhaps can't come into the outpatient setting. Um, so we might see them in their home. And then there is also the hospital, such as Moffitt Cancer Center, other local hospitals. So that will be for patients who are admitted inpatient. Um, and maybe they have had, you know, some that maybe they have to have a surgery or something like that. So we're working with them while they're inpatient. Um, and then here at Moffitt, we also have the outpatient setting at the hospital too. So we'll see the patients once they've been discharged, we can still follow up with them on the outpatient side. They're 
home, they're stable, but they still need additional rehabilitation. Um, so that's what the medical speech pathologist, those are some of the environments that you might find us there. Um, there's also a school-based, of course, so working with little kiddos who may have some articulation errors, perhaps, um, or some speech and language delays, maybe even some social pragmatic things going on um, because of different diagnoses or things like that. We will work with them in the school system. And then private practice also, um, and that can be adult or pediatric. So um, again, a private standalone practice can be owned by, by somebody, a company or a person, and we will meet the patient there and um, just work on some more, more goals about maybe their speech, language, if they're still having some swallowing issues or voice issues. Now let's talk a little bit about the history of speech language pathology. Um, so it actually started back in the 18th century in England. Um, the focus then was on elocution, but it quickly shifted to communication disorders, um, fluency and um, maybe stuttering, those sorts of things. Then the American Academy of Speech Correction was established in 1926. Um, then World War II, shortly thereafter, soldiers um, were having brain injuries, of course, um, and they were, coming home and they, they had something called aphasia, a lot of them, where it was difficult to speak and communicate because of these brain injuries that they had. So speech pathology started working a little bit more with these um, soldiers and in this environment, in this kind of situation. Then um, in the 40s and 50s, there was research um, started with the brain processing abilities, so expressive and receptive language, more research was coming about um, how to help all of these people who are experiencing these sorts of symptoms. And then in the 60s through the 80s, there was an enhanced understanding and ability to treat language delays and disorders. So um, maybe not even so much the um, expression, but Maybe it was just taking, um, you know, challenging for, for people to maybe understand everything and um, really develop their language in a way that was in keeping with kind of the social norms of, of what we do and how we communicate with each other. And then a little bit more recently in the 70s through the 2000s, we as speech pathologists really started establishing our role in swallowing disorders. And here at Moffitt, that's um, a really, really big piece of what we do, working with patients who are having swallowing issues. Um, so that became more um, established and just more, more common and um, more research was done and research is still ongoing about how to really optimize um, swallowing and how, how we can help patients. So that's kind of a little bit of a newer side, but, but very significant portion of what we do. And then more recently, um, 21st century, again, focusing on pragmatic use of language. So again, some um, social pieces and um, just pragmatics and um, uh, kind of just how we interact with each other and um, uh, so a little bit more higher level functional sorts of things. So it's a, it was a really um, kind of kind of quick evolution, I guess, over the last, um, you know, maybe more so 70, 70 or so years. So, um, but it's, it continues to grow and develop and, and new things are added all the time with our research and all that. So it's a really exciting field. Um, so the first thing I'll talk about, the first disorder that I'll talk about is voice disorders. Um, there are a lot of different causes that could lead someone to have a voice issue. So it could be trauma, maybe to the head and neck area where your vocal cords are. It could also be a neurological issue going on. So someone who may have um, Parkinson's or some other sort of um, disease process that's going on, um, maybe um, a lesion or something like that going on in the brain that impacts their ability to voice and use their voice. Radiation, if they had radiation to the head neck area, that can certainly impact it. Um, stress and tension of the throat muscles also, um, that we see that pretty frequently, a lot of just tightness going on that can impact, kind of make a strangled voice, and then changes to the vocal cords themselves. So what we do is we will do an assessment with the patient, we'll um, you know, get a referral from the physician and they come into our clinic. Um, and we will complete an assessment with them, um, including taking some acoustic measurements, just kind of what, what does their voice sound like? What sort of, there's some numerical values that we can try and sort out to figure out, is this normal, is this abnormal, and in what way? 
We'll do a thorough um, case history with the patient, a questionnaire trying to sort out what are their concerns and what are they noticing. And then most importantly, in my opinion, we'll do something called a video stroboscopy. Um, and I'm gonna show you an example of what that is, but uh, this is a, a picture of what a video stroboscopy looks like where we use a scope that um, can be placed through the nose actually. And then it kind of gives us a bird's eye view of the vocal cords so we can see what's going on and we can see um, how are the vocal cords working and, and kind of what do they look like and how does that translate to sound and is there anything we can do to try and improve that. So a warning, this next slide shows a video from a demo of, of a video stroboscopy. It shows tissues of the voice box and the vocal cords moving together. So if you're squeamish, you may wanna consider turning away for the next minute. There's no blood or bodily fluids at all, but it does show tissues moving. All right. So this is an example of what we would see during a normal video stroboscopy. So we'll assess the patient in a variety of different pitches and different voice tasks to see what their vocal cords are doing. And again, in this example, actually, this is exactly what the vocal cords should be doing, where they're opening symmetrically and smoothly and everything looks, looks the way it's supposed to. Um, so that's an example of what a video stroboscopy looks like. Next, we'll talk about speech language disorders. Um, so there's a difference between speech, which I consider to be more so the articulation and pronunciation of words, and then the language side. So first with speech, the pronunciation of words, that's more of the motor movement. Um, with your lips and your tongue and all of that. Speech can be slurred, it can be imprecise. Um, perhaps again, after maybe a stroke or something where part of the tongue or the lips are not working as well as the other side, it can lead your speech to being uh, imprecise. The rate of speech might be too slow or too fast. The pitch or the tone of your voice can be um, irregular. So maybe it's a little bit of a higher pitch than it maybe used to be or a lower pitch or maybe it fluctuates more than it used to. Could also have a hypernasal or hyponasal. So a little bit more air passing through the nose to, to give a, a different sort of sound or kind of like a clogged nose sound. Um, and that can all be related to some of the structures that are going on within the mouth and the face and all of that. And then on the language side, we have more so the um, just kind of like the words coming out and having a hard time thinking of the right word to say, maybe saying the wrong word. Um, so say spoon instead of fork or saying words that are not real. So you might say plor instead of floor. So those are some examples of language issues, perhaps not saying any words at all. So in very severe cases, um, patients may not be able to get any speech or words language at all out. Um, perhaps repeating the same words over and over and really getting stuck on a word and not being able to move past it or not being able to think of another word except for that one. Um, not understanding the words that are being spoken. So from a comprehension standpoint, that can be an issue. And then saying sentences that don't make any sense. So the grammar could be incorrect or kind of jargon, that sort of thing. So that's the language side of it. In this situation, um, again, causes can be similar to, to some of the other things. So neurological disorders, again, um, Parkinson's or different progressive dementias, um, tumors, of course, can impact uh, based on the location of where they are within the brain. That might impact uh, one's ability to find the right words or to speak them correctly. A stroke or brain swelling also can impact that. So um, in this situation, we would have patients also come to our clinic. We've got a variety of different assessments that we use depending on what the main complaint is. So if it's more of a complaint of articulation or um, the rate of speech or the, the words are a little bit slurred, we've got one assessment for that. If it's something, you know, gosh, um, I just cannot seem to think of the right word and I'm just, my speech is kind of empty and I'm searching for the word, we've got another assessment for that. Um, so it'll just depend on, on what the patient's concerns are and what their family members are noticing as well. Swallowing disorders. So this, um, I said, is a, a pretty significant piece of what we work with frequently here at Moffitt Cancer Center. There's a lot of different causes here as well. Similarly, there could be neurological, there could be trauma, um, again, to the oral 
area to the tongue, the lips, the face, something like that, the teeth that could be impacting the ability to chew and swallow surgery. That's a very common situation that we see here at Moffitt where our patients have had um, a, some sort of resection because to, to get rid of a tumor that might be present. So maybe a portion of their tongue or a portion of their cheek or something like that, their jawbone maybe has to be removed and reconstructed and that will impact their ability to swallow typically. So we'll, we'll work with them on how to sort that out and make it work the best for them. Cancer treatment, that one too, very common head and neck um, radiation. So if there's um, a tumor maybe in the throat area and then the patient needs to have radiation to that area, it can lead to some swallowing issues related to maybe pain, maybe swelling, maybe um, dysfunction of some of the muscles and tissues and things like that that were working normally, but now because of the damage from the radiation are not working normally. And then also sometimes a gastrointestinal source, so maybe reflux or um, a narrowing somewhere in the esophagus that can lead to swallowing issues. Some symptoms that patients report, um, more than one might notice, would be feeling like food is getting stuck in the throat, if um, they're coughing or choking when they're eating and drinking, if food is spilling out of the mouth, difficulty chewing, and then the most severe situation would be if there's pneumonias, fevers, chest congestion, something going on in the lungs that um, is really unexplained, doesn't have a good explanation otherwise, um, then maybe there's some swallowing issues leading to food or liquids going down the wrong pipe and then to turning into a lung infection. The first thing we'll typically do is something called a clinical swallowing evaluation. So we'll see the patient, we'll give them various things to eat and drink. We'll look at the muscles of their mouth. We'll look at their lips, their tongue, their teeth. Is everything functioning the way it's supposed to? Is there some asymmetry going on that can kind of help guide us? Um, and then we'll try different textures. So usually that includes water or a liquid, um, maybe a different consistency, depending on how things are going, maybe a thicker water might be easier for them, a puree texture, and then a solid texture. We may recommend further testing for these patients at well, as well if we're not sure what we're seeing at, kind of clinically at the bedside or in our clinic. This next slide, I'm gonna show you a couple of those um, additional assessments that I was telling you about. So the first one is a modified barium swallow study. Um, and the second one is a video from something called a FEES. Um, the video of the modified barium swallow study is swallowing barium under fluoroscopy. Um, the other video is swallowing using a scope similar to the video stroboscopy. So there'll be images of um, tissues from the voice box and some saliva and some juice. There's no blood. So again, if you're a little squeamish, you may wanna hold off for another moment or two before coming back, um, but it, it'll look pretty similar to the video stroboscopy. So first here, let's see. Okay, I'm going to pause here. So it looks like that modified barium swallow study is not working. I don't know if you want me to just... Do you want to try clicking? Did you try clicking into the video? Um, so when I click into it, it that's where it, it like took me to the next slide. Oh. Jackie, do you have any um, idea why it could... Maybe it's not loading? And that's what it looks like for this one too. And like on that second one... Oh, okay. This there one looks know. like it'll... Yeah, okay. that one's good. Um and that's it's so I weird because it was working earlier. We both tried it and it was fine. Um, mm -hmm. Do you want to go back to the other slide and come back to it? Sure, and see what happens. Okay, Jackie, I don't, I can't hear you in the inside the recording for some reason. Jackie was talking, but it just oh. wasn't coming through on this. She's just sitting next to me. That's why. Oh, I, can hear I see. It. <laughs> okay. So, can you guys mm -hmm. hear me? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, maybe what we can do, since this is a recording and we can chop it up and edit, um, maybe, uh, Robin, if you want to stop sharing your screen temporarily, and then maybe, mm -hmm. Amanda, if you want to share yeah. just okay. for the video part, and then, uh, Robin, you can talk during that part, and then we can uh, just have you share again when you're done. <laughs> sure. Sounds good. All okay. right. So I, I think I stopped sharing, so we should be good there. All right. Here, put this back here. Are you seeing everything? Yes. Oh yeah, it's not working. Not working for you either, huh? Hmm. Uh, like that. I second, don't know if it'll work that's... for me, but I'll try. <laughs> it's working like when you're in the regular. Yeah, that's so odd. And it did like I I went to present it. Yeah, it just seems inconsistent. I think at the end of the day, long story short, that was kind of my. Just seems inconsistent. Oh, yeah, because I can maybe. press it here, but let me try to. 
Can I try like it on video? Yeah, let me stop sharing. All right. So let's try. And then... uh Oh, I think Robin left. Oh, I'm here. I, I'm here. Oh. oh, I don't know where you're. Oh, okay. Can you can you not see me or I don't know. So it's working it. on my end. Okay. I think maybe because I shared it with you guys and I have the original on oh. my like, one, I think maybe, I don't know. I don't know. But the thing helps. is, the only thing is Robin's, can you see Robin, Jackie? Because I can't. I can see Robin. Oh, all right. Well, as are long we as you can see her. Are you recording. still recording? Okay. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know technology right <laughs> who knows right. it's like okay so I guess what I'll do then I'll just okay so I'll just I already did that slide so I'll just pick up from where the video piece shows up I'll explain that uh -huh. I'll explain the fees and then we can stop there because I think yep. that's the last video and then we'll go back to me sharing the screen so then I can kind of go through perfect okay. sounds great thank you Robin sure All right, so this is a modified uh, barium swallow study that you are seeing moving here. Um, so this is a patient who's drinking barium. That's the black liquid that you can see. And then that allows us to see, um, are, are things going down the wrong way, basically. In this case, a little bit, things are going down the wrong pipe, um, but it'll give us some insight into why is that happening? Perhaps what structures are working or not working? Um, is there anything that can make it better for them? What swallowing exercises might be appropriate? And then this next one is the fees. So again, this is similar to that video stroboscopy that I was talking about. It's the exact same equipment, essentially. Um, we just use a little bit of a different lighting source and lighting technique. Um, so in this situation, we're able to, again, get a bird's eye view of what's happening with the swallowing. Um, in this case, they're swallowing some juice. It's, it's kind of hard to tell. It does take quite a bit of training to be able to sort out what's happening and see what you're looking at, but those are some of the structures um, just from a different perspective. So the same anatomy, just a different view of it and it allows us to see exactly is food or liquid entering the windpipe, which you can see there that V is the windpipe, um, which we don't want anything to enter into that area, of course. So it allows us to see exactly where are things going? Is there residue? What consistencies are working and uh, what strategies might be helpful for the patient? Great. All right. So let me see if I can remember how to share my screen. No worries. I can help you. If okay. I think I got it. All right. Can you see it now? Uh, can you see it now? Um, perfect. Okay. And then I will go through the next one. Let's see. I've got it. I, I double clicked a couple times. I have a feeling it might like jump ahead here. Let's see. Okay, there it goes. Okay. Alrighty. Um, okay, I'll go ahead and pick up here. All right. So head and neck cancers. Um, again, this is very, oh, sorry. Let me start over. Camera right back over here. Okay. All right. So head and neck cancers. Again, this is a very, um, big piece of, of the patient population that we see here at Moffitt Cancer Center in the speech pathology department. So as I kind of alluded to earlier, it can involve different structures of the tongue, the lips, the cheek, the nose, different parts of the throat. So a patient might require radiation, chemotherapy, surgery, or a combination of all of these things. And as a result, there can be some swallowing issues. Um, it can also lead to speech and voice issues. So we can try and help patients in all of those areas. Neck radiation, as I again kind of spoke to before, it's delivered to a part of the head and neck that has the tumor present. So the radiation changes the tumor's DNA so that it cannot replicate and grow anymore. Um, as a result, it can have a lot of side effects. So it can um, lead to dry mouth, the changes in the way foods taste or different sores in the mouth or the throat, and perhaps even long-term swallowing concerns um, just because the tissues can be altered pretty significantly long-term. So the speech pathologist will help by assessing the patient um, before the treatment starts. So we try and see our head and neck cancer radiation patients and even our surgical patients before the treatment occurs. Um, so that way we can basically see where they are right now at baseline before any um, impact is made to their swallowing or speech. 
um, so we can document all of that and also just give the patient um, a lot of information about what to expect. So how will their swallowing change, talking about some of these side effects. So that way it's not a big surprise when it comes and they're better prepared. Um, they can get things in place at home. So that way, if they do start experiencing some swallowing issues, they know what to do. They know how to modify their foods. They know um, what exercises to do to try and reduce the risk of this turning into a significant issue. And um, also, you know, how to get in touch with us if, if they need to see us sooner. We try and see them during their treatment um, at least once or twice. And then certainly after the treatment's over, we like to reassess to make sure things are going as expected. Um, so surgical interventions, again, alluded a little bit to this earlier. So that too can affect any part of the head and neck. So with the tongue, they may have to have um, maybe a portion of their tongue removed, half, perhaps even all of the tongue in some situations. Some of the cheek, jawbone, the roof or the floor of the mouth, maybe parts of the throat. So again, we'll see the patient before surgery, discuss education about how their speech and swallow function might change after surgery, what to expect, and what our role is going to be during that process. Process. Then we'll assess the patient after surgery has been completed and help guide them um, to kind of kind of a new normal. Again, if you have a, a pretty significant piece of anatomy removed and reconstructed, it, it may not allow things to function the way that they did before the surgery, but we're going to be there every step of the way to try and make it as, um, as functional as possible. So we can really give them lots of um, tips and ideas and guidance and just some experience and perhaps some exercises as well to try and make things work better for them. Another population that we work with are patients who have had something that's called a total laryngectomy. So again, we mentioned with head and neck cancer, there could be issues with the throat. So a laryngectomy is when your voice box is removed. So pre-laryngectomy, we have um, your, your anatomy here, I've got this image to, to show you. There is um, the tongue, which is in the oral cavity. You've got the teeth, and then you've got the throat, and then the throat actually separates into two areas. So it separates into your food pipe, which is your esophagus, and then your windpipe, which is your trachea. Um, and as we all know, sometimes you swallow, things go down the wrong pipe, and you cough, and all of that. That's because it's all connected. So after your surgery, after a total laryngectomy surgery, when the voice box is removed, the food pipe and the um, windpipe are no longer connected. So a patient will breathe through something called a stoma, which is basically a hole in the neck. And so that's where they breathe and then they swallow like normal through their mouths. Um, so this is again, a, a, big, a big change. Um, so speech pathology department really helps to navigate this with the patient, give a lot of education and um, help them resume resume life, you know, the best that they can afterwards. Um, because they don't have a voice box, they can't communicate the same way as they did before. So there's a couple of different options here and the speech pathologist will help them. So one example is an electrolarynx, um, which is that little gray tube that you can see there that's being held up against the neck. That is, um, that's a, a device that vibrates very quickly and will vibrate the tissues of the throat and the mouth. So that way, when the patient tries to speak, um, you know, moving the lips and moving the tongue, the air is basically vibrated um, and then words are understood because as you know, when we talk right now, it's just our vocal cords vibrating, the air that's passing through and it's shaped by our lips and our tongue and all of that. So this really just tries to replace the vocal cords. Um, another option for some patients is something called a tracheoesophageal prosthesis or a TEP. So the way this works, it's a similar diagram here, but um, in the bottom portion of the picture, you'll see a little white tube, basically. It's a one-way valve that connects. Um, it, it's a separate puncture that's made to reconnect the food pipe and the windpipe. What happens in this situation is when you're breathing through the, your lungs and through the stoma, that hole in the neck again, when you breathe through that and you close off the stoma, the hole in the neck, the air then gets basically redirected and pushed through that prosthesis, that little tube looking um, device. And then the air goes up into the esophagus and vibrates the esophagus. And then the patient can speak um, a little bit more naturally, actually. Some patients have a lot of success with this and they sound really quite normal. Um, 
there are some risks, of course, involved. So the speech pathologist will work with the patient and the doctor to make sure this is an appropriate um, method of communication and, you know, just go through all of the information there. But this is also a pretty um, really impactful thing that speech pathology can do. And it's um, really quite specific to, to a trained head and neck cancer speech pathologist. It's not something that all speech pathologists can do. It takes quite a bit of training. So we're really proud at Moffitt that we have the staff here who can manage these patients. Um, now I'd like to give you a little preview about what it looks like in the day of a life of an SLP, speech language pathologist. So this is just an example. This is not, you know, no one is, is real here, but this is a very common, could be a very common situation to what is happening. So um, 7.30 in the morning, we arrive to work. So I'll check for new evaluation orders. I'll check outpatient orders and triage patients for the day. By 8 a.m., I'll walk upstairs, see a new evaluation for a patient who recently came off of the breathing machine to assess their swallow. Their voice is very whispered and they look to be coughing when they're drinking. So I'll recommend an MBS before starting a diet. That's that modified barium swallow study I showed you earlier. By 9 a.m., I've got a patient downstairs. I'm gonna complete a video stroboscopy for an outpatient who recently had thyroid surgery. She's reporting tightness in her throat and her voice is being hoarse by the end of the day. The video stroboscopy reveals one of her vocal cords isn't moving as well. So I'll refer her to an ear, nose and throat doctor to see if they can provide a vocal cord injection to help her voice. 10 a.m., I run back upstairs to see two inpatients. One had surgery to remove a portion of his tongue last week. Today, he has a feeding tube in his nose. After his evaluation, I determine he's safe to start taking sips of water for pleasure. The other patient is too sleepy to participate in therapy since he just came back from a procedure. At 11 a.m., I'll go and complete the modified barium swallow study that I saw first thing this morning. She did great and she can start eating right away. At noon, I'll have lunch, chart all of the notes for the patients that I saw this morning. And then at 1 a.m., I'll work with the patient and his wife to learn how to talk again after having a total laryngectomy surgery. He's using his electrolarynx very well, but he would like to talk with someone who has been through this before for support. I give him information about our support groups. At 2 p.m., a patient who recently underwent an MBS returns to my outpatient clinic to initiate dysphagia, swallowing exercises. She's very motivated to start swallowing again. At 3 p.m., I wrap up all of my documentation for the day. I'll touch base with doctors about all of the patients I saw and then look ahead for tomorrow's patients. So that's a very accurate um, depiction of what things look like. A lot of variety can happen throughout the day, which makes it really interesting. And um, again, we're just really, really proud that here at Moffitt, we're able to offer all of these services to our patients. So that concludes my um, presentation today. Thank you again so much for letting me speak with you. I really enjoyed it. Thank you for reviewing this session. We offer live Meet the Expert sessions through Zoom. To see a full list of upcoming sessions, please visit moffitt.org slash meet the experts or call 813-745-1690.